Good morning. Um, welcome to the month of May. Hopefully it doesn't snow this month like it did last month. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, I hope you got to hear the music. I was sitting here listening to those hymns as they played and thinking, you know, I miss being together and worshiping God together in song. But, Lord willing, next month, things will loosen up enough so that we can gather in groups of less than 50, which pretty much defines this congregation, unless a lot of people are being in, becoming interested in us because of the, the Facebook videos that uh, we're posting. Um, oh, so much going on in my head right now. Um, I wanted to update everybody on Tom. Uh, Tom is in uh, Eastern Maine Medical Center. I think that's what they still call it. I don't know. But he's up in Bangor in the hospital. He's in ICU. He is in critical but stable condition. Um, he is now breathing on his own again. Uh, they removed the breathing tube. But the cardiologists don't know that there's anything that they can do to help him because his heart is so bad. So we need to be praying for Tom and Sally as they go through this difficult challenge in their life. Um, also, uh, I learned yesterday, I, I knew this was happening, I just didn't know it was happening this fast. I learned yesterday that DJ is moving to Oklahoma on Tuesday. So, we need to be praying for Donna as she moves back home to Oklahoma. Um, am I forgetting it? I'm sure I'm forgetting something. I always forget something. But, those are the big things that are on my mind right now. Um, also, um, it's weird. I have acquired a, at least another 50 Facebook friends worldwide because of some of these videos and I guess people have a lot of time on their hands right now so they're just on Facebook so uh, talking to people around the world um, the virus is an issue of course but the bigger concern right now is food people in third world countries are having a difficult time getting food so we need to be praying for, because there's really not much else that we can do, we can't physically send them food. So we need to be praying for people around the world dealing with food issues and starvation, honestly. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this technology the ability that we have to communicate over long distances and, and share our hearts with one another this way. Father, there's so much in front of us right now facing us that is scary. We don't know what's next, but you do. You are in control. And we pray that you will bless us with safety and health father we pray for tom and sally as they they deal with what's going on with tom in the hospital we pray that you bless them with courage and peace and strength we pray for donna as she prepares to travel west that you will protect her and give her wisdom and strength and courage and we pray for everyone around the world who is facing food shortages we just pray that you will find a way to be able to provide food for those people 
it just seems so minuscule right now that I ask for myself that you, you be with me during this time, that you help me to give this message that I've prepared, that you, you speak through me and that I, am, I don't get in the way of, of your message. Father, you bless us with so much, and we thank you, we thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Transitions in life are, honestly, they're the most challenging parts of life, but sometimes they're, they're also the most exciting. Moving to a new place, starting a new job, starting a new grade in school or moving to a new school, all of these can be exciting, but they can be scary sometimes too. In writing and in speaking, a transition is a connection between two different sections or different paragraphs. The deeper the connection between the two sections, the, the more seamless or natural the transition between those sections. They seem to flow from one to the next, and they, they carry the interest of the reader or the listener. Now, both kinds of transitions can be difficult to do well. Changing jobs, especially if you're completely changing a career path like, like I did, uh, it can be a shock to the system. It's kind of like graduating from high school and moving on to college. You go from being the experienced person, the, the uh, big man on campus, if you will, the one with all the knowledge, to being the lowly freshman again, lost and fumbling around, trying to figure out what you're supposed to do, where you're supposed to go, and how to organize yourself so that you don't get completely lost. But as the hymn says, time is filled with swift transition, not of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Now the Gospel of John has a lot of interesting transitions of different types throughout the book. So far we, we're almost done with chapter 3. And we've seen a lot of different things going on. John the Immerser baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. Several of John's disciples following Jesus. Jesus going to Galilee and then to Cana for a wedding. And then back to Jerusalem for Passover. And then the visit from Nicodemus. And that brings us to where we are now in chapter 3 in verse 22. John 3, 22, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. After this. That's how John starts this section of his gospel, but, but what is he saying here? Is he saying that after Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he got up and went out into the Judean countryside? Did he wait until morning? Or did he immediately leave the discussion and go out? Or, or did he wait a few days? And here's where we run into the chronological problem in the Gospel of John again. John did not write a play-by-play -play description of what Jesus did in his life. John's Gospel was written with a specific purpose, and that was to inform belief and faith in Jesus not to tell the story of Jesus' life. The other three gospel accounts, what scholars call the synoptic gospels, follow Jesus through his life, or a part of it, explaining what he did in order. John's gospel is different because it's organized thematically. John starts with a conceptual topic and then gives anecdotes that support that Theme. Now, this section started in the beginning of what we have marked as chapter 2 with the wedding feast in Cana. We see Jesus at the feast, followed by him at the temple for, before Passover, and then meeting with Nicodemus, and now 
this, Jesus in the Judean countryside, and a discussion with John the Immerser. Now, did you notice what I said in that verse I read? It's something that we don't really think about, and it's kind of strange, actually. Jesus and his disciples were immersing people. John's gospel is the only gospel that says that Jesus and his disciples were immersing people like John did. But in the beginning of the next chapter, in chapter 4, John will clarify his point, saying that really only Jesus' disciples were the ones who were immersing people. As the leader of the group, whatever the group does, Jesus did by proxy. Jesus' disciples were representing him. So he, was, he and his disciples were immersing people, but his disciples were physically the ones who were immersing. So let's keep reading. Uh, verses three, uh, 23 and 24. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. So now we have two groups baptizing or immersing people, John and his disciples, and Jesus and his disciples. And the evangelist tells us that, that John was immersing people at a place called Anon, near Salim. Scholars don't know where that is. But we do know a few things about it. First, it was in the Judean countryside. Or at least it was near the Judean countryside. Some scholars have speculated that it was near the border between Judea and Samaria, and possibly even in Samaria. The second thing that we know about it is that there was water there. John says that water was plentiful there. Anon means the place of springs. So it may not have been a town, but simply a description of the location where there was a lot of water. Salim is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word shalom, or the Aramaic word salam, which both mean peace. Now, John does a little bit of editorializing in verse 24, telling us that this all happened before John was in prison. John, writing this gospel many years after the events took place, was pointing out some of the historical timing of this event. He's ensuring that his readers realize that John was, in fact, put in prison and executed by Herod Antipas. John was arrested for speaking out against Herod's marriage to Herod's brother's ex-wife. According to Josephus, a first-century Jewish historian, John was imprisoned in a fortress on the eastern side of the Dead Sea, but was not executed immediately because of fear of the people's reaction. Herod's wife, however, didn't disguise her feelings about John and influenced her daughter to ask, for, ask Herod for John's execution. But since we see John the Immerser doing things, it's kind of obvious that this takes place before he was arrested and executed. But that sentence reinforces to me that John was not writing this in chronological order, and he needed to point that out. Now that John has set the stage for this discussion, let's, let's keep going. Verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Now this brings up the question, why were they discussing purification? Jesus' disciples and John were immersing people in different places, but it was obvious that they weren't doing this in secret. They were, they were out in the open. Both groups were immersing people in places where the water was in its natural state. Jesus and his disciples were on the Jordan River, a naturally flowing river, and John was in a place of many springs, where water pools were coming up from the ground, also naturally flowing. I'm em emphasizing naturally flowing because of what Jewish tradition surrounding the law of Moses has determined the best place to perform the rite of ritual purification in living or naturally flowing water. 
In the law of Moses, a Jew was required to wash after encountering something that was unclean or after recovering from an illness or other issues that were considered to be unclean. The priests were required to wash prior to entering, the, approaching even, the tabernacle. And when the temple was built, everyone was required to immerse themselves in water prior to entering the temple area. Archaeologists have found many stone pools near the area of the temple. These are called mikvot, but that's the plural, the singular is mikvah. Each mikvah had stairs going down into the water on one side and coming up out of the water on the other side. So the person going to the temple would strip, walk down into the water, crouch and completely immerse themselves in the water, and then walk up the other set of stairs and be considered clean. Now this ritual immersion prior to entering the temple was like what John had been doing in the Jordan River back in the first chapter of John. He was immersing people who said that they were turning away from their sins, washing them to become ritually clean. A baptism of repentance. Okay, verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. Sounds a little nervous to me. Hey boss, this, this Jesus guy that you baptized, he's got his own group now, and, and they're on the Jordan River now baptizing people, and everyone's going to them and not coming to you. John's disciples were concerned that John was losing influence. John had built a big following. Like I said earlier, the first century Jewish historian Josephus actually included John in his histories. He made the books. He was an important person in Jewish history during this time for positive and negative reasons. We see him preparing the way for Jesus and being a witness to Jesus. The Jews eventually saw him as a political thorn in the side of Herod that needed to be restrained and then eliminated. Verses 27 and 28. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ but I have been sent before him. Now John ties it back to purification, but not in a way that's really obvious. Let me see if I can explain what I mean. Everything we have comes from God. That's what John is saying here. Even the air we breathe comes from God because God made everything. John will, will tie more of these things to this concept here a little bit, but that's the main point that he's making. Everything comes from God. Everything, including forgiveness and purification. So even though John was performing a rite, administering a baptism of repentance, the actual forgiveness and purification was coming from God and not from John. Now John emphasizes the reason that he came his purpose for existing. He was a witness to the Christ, and they were witnesses to him doing just that. He came baptizing people who repented of their sins, but the forgiveness and purification that they received came from God, not from him. He was preparing people for the Messiah that was coming. He was not the message, he was the messenger. To help explain what he was talking about, John used a parable. Verses 29 and 30. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. John compares his situation to that of being the best man at a wedding. In first century Jewish culture, the best man, or the, the friend of the bridegroom, 
has a few responsibilities at the wedding. He is the master of the feast for the wedding, responsible for ensuring that there is enough wine and enough food for the party. But he has a more significant responsibility during the multi-day feast. He escorts the bridegroom to the marriage chamber where the marriage is consummated and waits for word from the bridegroom. When he hears from the bridegroom, he brings word to the guests at the feast and they all rejoice together. John is telling his disciples here that he doesn't have the primary role here. His position is simply to prepare people for the bridegroom and to bring witness about the bridegroom. He has done that. So now his job is finished, or in John's word, this joy of mine is now complete. He has shared the news about Jesus, identified him, and now his importance is decreasing. John's disciples don't really understand what he's trying to explain to them. They were his disciples. They followed John, although, although some had left John to follow Jesus, as we saw in chapter 1. John had prepared the way for Jesus. Now he had to get out of the way and let Jesus do what he needed to do. Jesus would increase in importance while John would decrease in importance. Now the rest of chapter 3 is similar to what we talked about, in the, about last week. It's a section of scripture where we really don't know if John the Immerser is the one that he's speaking, or if the evangelist writing the gospel is expounding on what we just read. And like last week, I lean toward it being John the Evangelist expounding on what we read. So, chapter 3, verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. Now this verse ties us back to Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus and with the initial introduction to the gospel back at the beginning of chapter 1. Jesus is the one who comes from above. He was sent by God. He pre-existed the world and all creation and was actually the architect of creation. Now the Greek word translated from above in this version is the same word that is translated as again in the phrase born again during Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. Same Greek word. Jesus comes from above and we must be born again again or from above. Because Jesus comes from above, he understands heavenly things. But he's also a man. So he understands earthly things. That's one reason why Jesus used earthly stories to describe heavenly things. We earthly humans are kind of stuck with being earthly in our understanding, which is another reason why Jesus used earthly things to describe heavenly things and help us to try to understand what he was trying to get across. But just as John the Immerser said that he was not the Messiah, he also said that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus came from above, and because he was from heaven, he was above all things. God gave Jesus all authority in heaven and on earth. Verses 32 through 34. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now you and I can't tell people what heaven is like. We have never been there. We don't know. Jesus, on the other hand, came from there. So he can explain what heaven is like. 
And he did, in his parables, like I said before, describing heavenly things with earthly stories. But John says here in verse 32 that no one receives Jesus' testimony. No one believed him. I think that's a little bit of hyperbole because obviously someone believed him because the message about him has come down through the ages to us. And now it's up to us to believe him and his words. When we receive his testimony, we are verifying that God's words are truth. Since God is the definition of good and lying is the opposite of good, God doesn't and cannot lie. But as humans, we need verification of things. Verse 33 is legal terminology, testifying that something is true by affixing one's seal to it. It's like the, the, in, the, in the old times and in the old movies, putting a wax seal on an envelope. You drip the wet wax onto the, the envelope on the, to seal it shut and then you press your signet ring into the hot wax, and it, it proves that you were the one who sent the message, and that you approve of the contents. Since God sent Jesus, Jesus could explain heaven to us from his personal experience. But more than that, Jesus is God's representative, and is God himself. So when he speaks, he speaks the words of God. God, Jesus, and the Spirit are all one and are in complete agreement. So Jesus has an unmeasurable amount of the Spirit as opposed to other humans who receive a certain measure of the Spirit. Verses 35 and 36. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. God's love of the Son is complete. Everything the Father has, the Son has, and the Son has that unmeasurable amount of the Spirit because all three are together. Verse 36 is the culmination of this section. And the two previous sections, all of what we have marked here as chapter 3. Verse 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Here we see whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That specifies that those not condemned have eternal life. But it also shows that the converse, or the opposite of it, is also true. Those who are condemned do not have eternal life. In verse 18, the negative aspect of the discussion is not believing and thus being condemned. Here in verse 36, it's not obeying and thus not having eternal life. They all go together. Belief, faith, and obedience in Christ are what lead us to eternal life. If we don't believe, since we are already in a condemned state without belief, and who would obey something that they don't believe, really? The opposite of belief, faith, and obedience is disobedience and facing the wrath of God. The continuing thread throughout John's Gospel here is salvation through faith, belief, and obedience to Jesus. Continuity through transitions is the key to transitioning well for both literally trans literal, uh, literary transitions and for life's transitions. John uses deep continuity for his literary transitions tying this section to the other sections of the first part of his gospel. The discussion on purification rituals, tying back with John's immersing people in the Jordan. The six stone jars for the rites of purification at the wedding feast in Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. 
Jesus cleansing or purifying the temple courts, John comparing himself to a friend of the bridegroom connecting to the wedding feast in Cana, Jesus talking with Nicodemus about being born again or born from above, and John saying that Jesus is from above having to be born of water and the Spirit to see the kingdom of God, and Jesus being filled with the Spirit without measure. And then there's the physical transition that is happening here in these verses. John becoming less important, and Jesus becoming more important. Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher, said, change is the only constant in life. I disagree. Change is always going to happen in our lives, but God is the only constant in our lives. If you allow him to be a part of your life, and with God as a part of your life, you can hold on to his unchanging hand throughout all the transitions, and you will be connected to the rock that is unmovable. Um, I want to share a little bit as we prepare for communion. Um, hopefully you still have some of these left, the little uh, the cups with the, with the bread along with it. Um, we will be getting more out hopefully this week to everybody along with better instructions for the audio connection for those that don't have computers. Um, in Paul's first letter to the congregation in Corinth, he didn't pull any punches. He rebuked a lot of their behavior. But he also encouraged them to do what was right. And a part of the problem was that they were being selfish and greedy. So I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe that in part, for there must be fractions or factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. When we do get the opportunity to gather together, we need to do it for the right reason. We need to be united in our purpose to encourage each other and to share what we have just as the Christians in the first century did. We need to follow their positive example and learn from what Paul was telling the church in Corinth. But Paul didn't end here because he wanted to give that positive example. Keep reading duh, verses 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me the bread and I'm going to try to get this open here there we go the bread is for us to remember his unselfish sacrifice of his body. 
So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you that it reminds us of your son's sacrifice for our sins. Help it to be a constant reminder to us so that we may focus more on doing your will. In Jesus' name. Paul doesn't stop there. Verses 25 and 26. <clears throat> In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is contrasting Jesus' experience prior to his betrayal and crucifixion with what the Corinthian congregations were, were doing when they were trying to commemorate his death with the Lord's Supper. And he was correcting them. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this fruit of the vine that we use to remember the blood of your son that was sacrificed for us, the blood that cleanses us and covers our sins. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice, and we pray that we can do your will and that we can focus on helping others. In Jesus' name. We have a Zoom meeting that's actually going on right now, but we're also going to do it. It's going to continue as we study deeper this section of John chapter 3. The information, I don't know if you can see the screen or not, but it's also on Facebook as a, um, as an, a meeting, an invitation to everyone. You can dial this phone number, put in the meeting ID and the password, and then we will have a Bible study here momentarily. Um, thank you for, well, not coming, but tuning in at least and, and dialing in. And um, Lord willing, we will talk again next week.